Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar. And today we are pleased to have Rebe Feraldi, a Master of Science candidate in biomimicry from Arizona State University. Rebe has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Chemistry and Engineering from the Colorado School of Mines, from the Don Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Is expected to finish her Master of Science in Biomimicry from Arizona State University and the Biomimicry 3.8 Institute in 2019. She's the owner of Trans Sustainable Enterprises, which is a cross-disciplinary scientist with experience using industrial ecology tools to perform sustainability analyses. She's a certified LCA professional since 2010 and reviewer since 2016. As usual, we will save questions for the end of Ms. Feraldi's presentation, and please send those questions to me, Holly Harris, via chat privately, and I'll ask Rebe for you at the end. So, without further ado, welcome, Rebe. Thanks, Holly. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and thanks to everyone who's attending and taking time out of your day. Um, I'm very grateful to Earthshift to have uh, time to share my work because I, I like to evangelize about both life cycle assessment and uh, biomimicry, my two favorite things. Um, and the invitation talked about a, an amalgam method. Uh, but what, what I'm really trying to convey is uh, the value of and uh, propose an approach for using life cycle assessment. and biomimicry in tandem. So um, let's see, did we, am I able to advance these slides? There we go. And basically life cycle assessment uh, would be, the, the tandem value is that life cycle assessment identifies the hot spot, that's the quantitative approach. And then biomimicry is the qualitative approach um, that is then used to open up the design space at hot spots uh, for design innovation. And uh, it's one of the best tools for quantitative uh, analyses because the requirements for industrial products or service systems can be inventoried quantitatively throughout their life cycle. It's very holistic, it's systematic, um, and it's very effective at highlighting and measuring hot spots. And it basically has the potential, in my opinion, to be as revolutionary as nutritional labels were for consumer food products. And because it's so effective at measuring hot spots or places in the design or supply chain that are relatively poor environmental performers, it's, it's a perfect complement, uh, as I see it, to other sustainable innovation tools like biomimicry. So that's the... Uh, approach here is to, to look at how they work together, um, which is in itself, uh, biomimicry in itself is another way to measure sustainable innovation. It uses a set of deep patterns uh, that are in nature referred to as life principles. And they are things like use materials and resources efficiently adapting to changing conditions, life-friendly chemistry, etc. Um, and as Janine Vignes from the uh, founder of the Biomimicry 3.8 Institute says, a sustainable world already exists. And the answers to the questions we've been asking, how do we live here sustainably, are already all around us. Biomimicry is a relatively newish field, but I say this with some vexation because Humans have been emulating nature throughout our history, and we are part of biology after all. Um, however, the players in the biomimicry field are, were attempting to consciously systemize the emulation of nature to adhere to a set of deep patterns that I had mentioned that are life principles, life principles, and they can ultimately help us raise our sustainability bar, as it were. So not just to sustain human life, but to create conditions conducive to all life. And organisms in nature have over 3.8 billion years of research and development. So they figured out and had time to figure out what works and what doesn't on this planet. So it's embedded in their strategies 
and mechanisms or blueprints for surviving the same sorts of challenges that we face. And there was a seminal paper by Vincent and colleagues in 2006 that is describing basically analogs from biology to patented te technology. So they looked at about 2,500 conflicts and their resolutions in biology and sorted them by levels of complexity and then compared this to the same sorts of conflicts and resolutions in over 3,000 human technology patents and looked for analogs to see what, what are the differences between the mechanisms of, you know, solutions between biology and humans. And it's, it's revealing this study that humans kind of tend to rely on energy and substances, whereas nature relies on structure and information. And uh, so I guess in biology, it's, it's the equivalent of saying that materials are expensive, but shape is cheap. And it also reveals that humans tend to use a blunter, more global approach than nature, and, and we don't account for emergent properties, and that systems are considered sort of in isolation, although with life cycle assessment and other tools that some of us are familiar with, that paradigm is being shifted a bit. So the emulation piece, there's three pieces of biomimicry, the ethos, reconnect, and emulate, is, is really, to me, the meat of the biomimicry approach. And you can do this emulation at the form level, which is kind of what my case study is about, more like shape, fitting form to function. But it can also be performed at the process level and at a system level, and um, those are, you know, increasingly more complex to emulate. But um, my my talk will mostly focus on the emulation at the form level. And so the functional aspect of biology is really kind of what appeals to me in that um, it asks not what a solution or a design is, but whether what it does. So it's all about the verb. And this is an example of different industries and hot spots that may or may not be identified with LCA. I think LCA would be the best tool. Um, and then the functions, these functional bridging analogs that you can come up with using the biomimicry approach. So for instance, if you have rare earth elements, which bring us uh, great value in technology, all sorts of applications, but we have this hot spot of slurry tailing, well, then you can ask the question, how would nature manage electron flow? Or um, for waste management, you have landfill materials uh, for um, the hotspot. And then it, with the biomimicry approach, you can ask, how would nature attach and detach or disassemble? And for printing, you have uh, bisphenol A, which might be a hotspot in some aspects. Um, so for the biologist in question, you can say, how would nature impart color? And those of us that are familiar with life cycle assessment can see the obvious value in using it for innovation. Um, but some of us have had clients or have clients that perceive it as dampening to design and innovation. I think just last month, the American Center for Life Cycle Assessment, ACLCA, um, hosted a talk by Jeremy Faludi of the Thayer School of Engineering. Um, he did a, a presentation on whole system mapping and design method. And he, he really gave a good portrayal of like how to incorporate life cycle system to the design process as whole system. And I think that there are, are several of us working sort of in this aspect. And so that's kind of where I see life cycle assessment coming in when I also see the value of this tandem biomimicry approach because it asks us to rethink not just what something is, but rather what it does. And um, there's a whole taxonomy. This is kind of an eyesore. You're not expected to be able to read it, but um, there, it's just to, to kind of demonstrate the extent to which biomimics are trying to create these functional bridges between natural and human systems by asking how would nature insert, you know, function or verb. And um, that, that's doing that functional bridging. So 
So my only call to action during this presentation um, while I'm going through the case study is that uh, it might be helpful to kind of do your own work thinking about what's the, an industrial system you're familiar with or you've worked with or you're working with right now um, and to determine what might be the hot spot if you already know and then what functional need is that hot spot serving? How could you form, formulate a bridging question that asks you know, how would nature meet this challenge? So looking at printing and writing paper, this on the top is a um, energy contribution analysis and indicates the primary energy consumption of systems at the pulp and paper making step. Um, that's for energy. And this is all publicly available data from the National Council of Air and Stream Improvement. Um, 2014 paper LPA. So, and it's, it's not an untypical result. Life cycle assessments will often reveal that uh, the bulk of impacts are occurring at production steps. Not always, but often. And um, below you see that the, if you look at other life cycle, uh, if you look at impact categories, uh, you should see a, a similar trend across uh, pulp and paper making shown of all the life cycle steps in red. And then if you drill down further, you see of the steps in uh, the paper life cycle that the, the pulp and paper making um, step across impacts, a lot of the impacts are due to the production of uh, typical bleaching agents. Even though we have shifted to uh, chlorine free for most, most of paper making, there's still that production of these agents, and it is it, it is considered a, a hot spot in the system, especially if you normalize impacts. Uh, this is normalized to North American totals of impacts uh, per year, and you see uh, another sort of uh, dent in the human health carcinogen. And and that's a concern because most often pulp and paper mills are co-located with forestry operations which are really some of our most sensitive ecological systems. They're, they're showed here in the shaded colors and the, the uh, pulp and paper mills are shown in red dots. So printing and writing papers require high strength characteristics. And after finishing, there are some of the brightest paper products produced. And the process begins with the pulping step. That's this back here. <coughs> Excuse me. Wood pulp is uh, comprised of lignin, hemicellulose and cellulose. And the lignin is the glue that holds the wood fibers together and imparts a, a dark brown color. And the pulping process can be chemical um, for, for just overall. And that's where lignin is removed. But it can also be mechanical, where lignin is retained but treated just to mask the color. But chemical pulps are used in products that require more strength. And that's because um, they have a, uh, the, 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 even though mechanical pulping has a higher yield, the process weakens the product. And it, and it can discolor easily. So uh, we reserve that mechanical pulping process often for products like newspaper or tissue or paperboard. Um, in fact, the, the word craft or the craft process is German for strong. And so printing and writing papers are produced uh, primarily from craft chemical pulp. And they're largely a result of the, the most common bleach craft pulping method. So on which this case study focuses. And so, th and this dominates the industry and represents uh, a good proportion of all all uh, produced. So in this in this diagram, the steps are that wood chips are steamed, they're saturated, they're prepared for the treatment. The lignin uh, will resist saturation though. Um, and so that's why the, this step is required. And then the mix of the chips are into a hot caustic soda, and then sodium sulfate is very common um, for the white liquor process. And it's heated and pressurized, and that breaks down the wood components. 
to separate out the cellulose. And then the lignin, which imparts the dark brown color that you see like in things like paper or grocery bags. Um, the goal is to remove most of that uh, to make a porous material in which um, we can but, uh, impart the whiteness. But that can also damage the cellulose fiber. So the, the whole process is really a balance between um, sufficient treatment and controlling the level of refinement so that you don't damage the fibers. And so then we look at the context of this biomimicry approach being applied, uh, which has to be considered because um, it's no use asking how would nature unless you are going to have it work in the context in which you're investigating. So um, we look at brightness, which is paper whiteness. It's a measure of the whiteness of paper, and it's achieved by reflectance of blue light, which is the uh, around you know, 457 nanometers. And it's measured, they usually use a magnesium oxide standard with an optical brightness of around 96%. And for reference, you can consider that absolute black has a zero brightness. And opacity is another important quality um, of paper. And, well, and it's measuring the material's ability to impede light transmission. So in paper making, this means its ability to conceal what's behind it. And the ideal papers in printing and writing papers, uh, product systems have a high level of opacity. And that influences how visible the printed ink will be on the non-printed side. And cellulose fibers are inherently translucent, but in paper they're, they're sort of layered and networked, and that diffuses light. So to improve the opacity of cellulose-based paper, the light diffusing fillers like clay or titanium dioxide, calcium carbonate uh, is another one that are added. Um, but the opacity can also um, be decreased by the paper's whiteness. So again, it's a balance between uh, you know, refining properly and not too much. And you're asking in this context in the, from the biomimicry approach, how would nature and signals invisible light to impart whiteness in a thin film surrounded by air. And there are a lot of examples in nature that look white, and several of them achieve the reflection of uh, visible wavelengths through pigments, but most of them actually do it through structural arrangements on the visible wavelength scale, and that is nanostructure. So um, white is kind of rare for the insect group, but it turns out that they have achieved the most optimal thin film structures that impart bright whiteness. They have to balance the, the bright coloration with their mass, particularly for white, so their structures are ultra thin and ultra lightweight, which is ideal for this application. This butterfly uses a, a multi-layer microplate structure instead of a chemical pigment. And this little beetle is one of the most brilliant white creatures known. It's uh, whiter than paper or even milk tea. Uh, it uses a, a chitin photonic solid coating to scatter light uh, for camouflaging purposes. So it's, it's li literally a, a matter of life and death for this little guy. And this cuttlefish uh, uses little microspheres stacked, uh, stacked um, in a randomized order to scatter light in water, and that creates a matte white effect. And then we have this squid that uses uh, disks of uh, varying thickness, uh, around 200 nanometers, but again varying in randomized stacks so that it basically creates a, a brag stack, um, very passive, angle dependent, and it's a white light diffuser. So. And there are many, many examples. Uh, but this dragonfly is really interesting, especially for this case study, because it has nanoscale wax filaments that they're little crystalline wax uh, bits that achieve uh, tindal scattering. So basically, it increases the surface brightness uh, of its wings, which is another surface brightness being another thought or attribute in the, in the paper industry. So, all of these structures 
in these different organisms vary in their implementation, but they're consistently using shape to achieve a specific characteristic. Uh, the characteristics are being lightweight. Um, the shape is directionally oriented and disordered. They're nano size. They scatter visible light in the visible light wavelength range, 400 to 700 nanometers. And they're reflecting all colors. Sorry, reflecting. So that they're reflecting what light appears white. And so there's active research right now into um, emulating these structures. And it really does actually have the potential to offer low cost, uh, effective, ultra thin, lightweight nano coating materials uh, that would be alternatives to, first of all, chemical pigments some dyes, mineral fillers, possibly optical brighteners and whiteners in the paper industry. And this I included because it's a, a lab uh, photo showing a demonstration where a nano phase fiber coating, which was specifically emulating some of these structures, and also improved the hydrophobicity of paper substrates, which is a nice uh, sort of uh, bonus aspect. So another high value of using this tandem approach where you, you use life cycle assessment to identify hot spots um, and then biomimicry to open up the design space at the hot spots is to, to always go back as iteratively and look at the next hot spot, which in this case is the on-site fuel combustion. And if you drill down into that, and I don't have a chart showing this, but um, per available data, the um, on-site field combustion can, you know, a good portion of it can be related to treating the pulping effluent, which is um, often because of the bleaching agent. So, but, you know, just looking in it at it at, as itself, nature shows us that if you're going to treat fluids you want and pump them, you want to optimize for flow efficiency. And fluid movements in nature always follow the path of least resistance. Fluids, you know, whether you're talking about airs or gases or uh, liquids, they use spiral vortices and they follow uh, Murray's law of branching. So uh, you can think of whirlpools or river deltas or human lungs. Um, but right now, what we've so far done is to use industrial propellers fans, pumps, motors, and then we uh, use shaft and cog and wheel structures and pump through linear systems with right angles. So just by looking at redesigning like specific in infrastructural components to include spiral forcing motors, this is a, on the lower right a product from PAC Scientific. It's called the Lily Impeller, and it does it's just a little motor that um, in induces a centrifugal uh, fashion of movement in fluids. And they found that by using this coupled with vascular-like tubes in which, through which you pump fluids through, you can save over half of your energy requirement. Um, and so even better in this context is that um, effluents that move with a centrifugal force have been proven to instead of the mineral scaling on the side of pipes and ruining pipe infrastructure over time, which is a huge problem in the industry, um, they produce these little mineral pellets. Uh, they aggregate into little pellets that um, they actually can use as a, an, an added value byproduct um, in agriculture as a fertilizer. This is on the lower left uh, product from Crystal Green. And it's just a fertilizer that uh, is, is much more suited than a synthetic application because of its form, because it, it provides a continuous rather than a pulse release of minerals. So the nutrients are taken up mostly by plants instead of adding uh, to runoff as leachate. So there's uh, several pieces that you could continue to do iteratively. And my final piece that I would add is that um, you can always use, this is sort of a, a brain map of where you could go next. Um, but my, my final piece that I would add is that you could always use life cycle assessment to um, 
do post innovation uh, analyses uh, because because you always want to know what what is the efficacy of your implemented strategy. So not only is biocycle assessment the hot spot identifier, uh, it can I, it can point out areas in which to focus, but it can be the post focus uh, you know efficacy and uh, tool and. Um, and I think these two in tandem basically are not uh, necessarily something that everyone who is either in biomimicry or life cycle assessment would have thought to put together. But to me, it just seems intuitive that you would use one with the other. And I'm sure there's other approaches. So um, I would really love to hear everyone's thoughts on the, the tandem application. That kind of wraps up what I have for the case study for papers. And I did leave a little extra time for um, us to discuss because I was hoping there would be more questions um, in this session. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the resources I consulted and once again to thank Earthship for hosting, hosting me for this session for lunch. Um, and I encourage anybody who's interested to check out Arizona State University's biomimicry program. Um, I think it's one of the few offered. Uh, it's being offered in tandem with the Biomimicry Free 3.8 Institute at their life sciences department. And they do it uh, with a, a B Pro certification, a biomimicry professional, and you get to go on these uh, excursions that are sort of emergencies where you go to different habitats and investigate different uh, systems. And I did get to go on one of those, and it was just in a fantastic and very hitting home. like impressive you quite a bit. And obviously, it's also fun to be in situ. Um, but here's my contact information. And if we have time, we can open up to questions or discussion. I, again, I'd love to hear anyone's thoughts on the topic. Thank you, Rebe, for this <clears throat> fascinating talk on a fascinating subject. Um, we do have a few questions here. I'm in, and I'm encouraging other people to please send me uh, your questions privately. But the first one, one person says, interesting talk, Rebe. What attracted you to biomimicry at the beginning? Um, that's a good question. I think that I love measuring because I'm a quantitative person, but I don't want to just measure. I want to see application and results. And um, I also did grow up sort of surrounded by nature. So um, when I was a kid, we knew what happened to everything. Like when you think of mass balance, which is a lot of what LCA is, and material flow analyses, um, you know, when I was a kid, I knew where everything went. And then I, we moved to the city, and it just became this black box. <laughs> like, oh, look, they just take your trash away. We don't compost it or grow food from it. Um, and, or where what happens to the water and this, you know how does everything get treated and where does it come from and <laughs> so um, I think that just was a big influence on me especially then traveling the world and seeing systems where some of this works and some of it doesn't and you see all this fallout from you know where we've created systems that um, there are excellent aspects to it we've got part of it figured out but there there are just these these parts that, that aren't working. So so I, I'm just thinking, well, what does work? And and that's kind of what the biomimicry approach looks at is, is what has worked for millions of years. Mm -hmm. um, I have a listener who's asking if you could please explain the main differences between biomimicry and biophilic design. Great question. Um, so biophilic design is often just uh, reflecting a passion or sort of an ethos around nature in a holistic sense, but does not necessarily follow the life principles where you're using things, using life-friendly chemistry. It's not the whole piece. It doesn't go um, very deep. It's very um, emotional, uh, in my opinion, um, attraction to, to that that is of nature. And, and can have some really positive effects on humans because it's, because it's beautiful. Um, 
the biomimicry piece goes a little bit deeper and looks at uh, underlying patterns and systems in nature and tries to really, uh, on a physical, material, chemical level, like emulate those. Okay, thank you. And I have another question who says, how would LCA handle novel materials that aren't well studied yet in biomedic um, innovations? And if biomimicry centers around structure rather than substance on the human side, how does LCA capture those differences? Uh, yeah, very carefully. I've, I've tried to do it um, with nano, different nanotechnologies. And, and because of the lack of data um, and just no there's no availability of data because these things aren't processed yet. So you can't go to the production scale and say, this is what's going to happen. So it's really all theoretical. And in my opinion, from my previous work, you really have to get sort of a risk uh, assessment or like a toxicologist person involved to, to get that theoretical piece. Um, an example is um, using nanostructures to improve the efficiency of vehicle tires. Um, there's all kinds of opportunity there that can really, like, you know, save a lot of fuel, uh, reducing drag and improving efficiency in the flow, the way the, the tires grip the road, uh, or even just lifetimes of tires. Uh, but you also have these, you know, tire wears out over time, and so the tread is being released in tiny little bits all over. It's a, it's a non-discrete um, pollution source. So, so, and what are the effects of that? We don't know yet because we don't have data. Um, so you, you just have to, you, ha you can't do any of this, including biomimicry, even life cycle assessment by yourself. You really need a lot of specialists at the table. And I think that's a good overarching method, message for any interdisciplinary field. It's, it's just, you know, if you don't know, get help. Somebody who can at least project. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Okay, big question here. Does biomimicry really need LCA, or LCA really need biomimicry, or do they do just fine as methodologies on their own? I think probably uh, both have extreme value on their own. Um, obviously, life cycle assessment I've been doing over a decade. It's uh, kind of my career passion. I think it has huge value, um, but it's always playing into some other piece like uh, uh, industrial efficiency or industrial ecology or, or uh, you know, bottom line profit or, um, you know, the, the environmental labeling. It's, it's, it's always playing into another piece. And I think biometry is the same thing. It's not, in fact, all of the, the folks who are in my, my program, none of us are just doing biomimicry. We're all existing professionals kind of bringing this to the table. Um, as, a, as an augmentation to an existing expertise. It, it, it's not a standalone. Um, so I think, again, with the interdisciplinary field, it's just going to enhance uh, both of them when used in tandem. I think biomimicry is great on its own. I think LCA is great on its own. But um, I, I do see even added value, so greater than the, the, the whole being the greater than the sum of the parts, if you could use them together. Okay, and even though you talked about specialists, how would an LCA practitioner incorporate biomimicry thinking without having a biomimicry specialist on this team? So the, the basic premise is this, this biologizing function, um, the bridging between human systems and nature, and it's just to ask again, what is your system trying to achieve, and how would you uh, put verbiage to that in terms of the biologizing. You say not what it is, but what does it do? How does nature? And if you know, every, there's biologists float, you know, available to all of us at local universities and in your perhaps in your field. Ask a biologist to say, what do you think about this? I've I've turned this into a function of saying, you know, how would nature do this function? Uh, do you know of any organisms that do this, and how do they do it? So. Um, and I keep saying this, I feel a little bit redundant, but I feel like just bring, bring more people to the table. And, and if you don't know how, ask someone who can, because uh, none of us can do any of the sustainability stuff alone. Mm -hmm. that's and that's, <laughs> that is for sure. Uh, is biomimicry mostly for material systems, Rebe? I would say um, 
a lot of it right now is like material systems are the low hanging fruit. They're kind of easier to do than systems, than processes or systems. But there are examples like um, there's a train in Japan that's mimicking the shape of a bird that's got a really sharp beak and can dive really well. So this has reduced the sonic boom and increased the energy efficiency of how this train moves just by having this shape. So that's a form thing, right? Mm -hmm. But then you have processes like um, there's a uh, plant uh, from cholera that's mimicking how coral uh, sequesters carbon uh, carbon dioxide from the ocean and turn it into basically concrete cement. And so they're they're working on enzymatically scaling that up. So that's a process level emulation. And then you have whole systems like um, there's a solar concentrating plant. Um, that mimics the way the Fibonacci sequence uh, goes around in, in sunflowers to minimize uh, panels shadowing each other. Uh, so it's sort of a combination form and system. But then you have industrial, eco-industrial parts and so forth. Um, there's a project called the Mobius Project, and they have a system where a restaurant you know, sends out some of its waste and it goes through all these different steps and kind of comes back as profit for the restaurant. So that's another system example. Um, so, so yeah, it, it can be more than materials for sure, but the, the processes and systems are a little harder to, to grasp. Okay, thank you. It, what would be the primary client base for a combined approach such as this? I would say that you could be really creative with this. Um, in our program, we're seeing that uh, students that I'm uh, studying with, they're, they're from all over the world. They're in fields as diverse as engineering, uh, materials, uh, myself, like environmental assessments. But there's also architects, a lot of designers, business folks. There's a lot of applying this to social innovation. Um, you know, looking at like say the way superorganisms or use social uh, insects uh, divide labor. It, I mean, it's it's pretty diverse. So I think you could be pretty creative with it. You know, like I said, the low hanging fruit is going to be material stuff. So it's going to be industry looking at products that are incorporate certain materials, novel materials. But um, I, I don't think that's the limit by any means. Okay, thank you. And Ruby, we have one more question for you, unless anybody else has them more out there. But how do you see these approaches intersecting in the future? Oh, that'd be fun. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I know that this is kind of sci-fi sci a little bit, but or maybe not the way things are going. Biomimics envision that there will be an open source database of, of blueprints of different organisms. And there are some you know, available already, but that you could then have people be able to 3D print certain structures or emulate certain structures just through um, you having these blueprints on hand digitally. And then, of course, if you had, this is everyone's LCA dream, if you had like real time activity-based accounting so that databases could be constantly updated with, with real-time uh, data, and, and you could combine those two, um, what could we come up with? If, if that, would, that would be fun. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Rebe. It's been a pleasure having you here. I'd like to invite everybody to our next um, Brown bag webinar next month on May 30th, where we will be talking about the financial case for high performance buildings with Devin Bertram from Stoke. And um, that should also prove to be interesting. So thank you all. As usual, we will record, we, this has been recorded, and we will have it up on our website as soon as we can get it up there, hopefully next week. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, everybody.